Our distinguished speaker today is Professor Harold Hongju Ko, the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. Professor Ko is one of the country's leading experts in public and private international law, national security law, and human rights. He first began teaching at Yale Law School in 1985 and served as its 15th dean from 2004 until 2009. From 2009 to 2013, he was the legal advisor to the U.S. Department of State, for which service he received the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award. Professor Ko has received numerous honorary degrees and awards for his human rights work, his scholarship, which is enormous, and his service. Professor Ko holds degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Law School. After law school, he served as a law clerk for Judge Malcolm Wilkie of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and then Justice, Associate Justice Harry Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. It was during that second year of clerking that Harold and I became friends, and we have been great friends ever since. What a pleasure and honor to have such a distinguished and thoughtful person here with us today, Professor Coe. Dean Levy, faculty, parents, and friends, uh, thank you for inviting me here to Duke. I have the greatest affection for your law school and especially for your great Dean David Levy. They say here in Blue Devil Country, some people talk the game, but can they play the game? And after knowing Dave for three decades uh, as a law clerk, a prosecutor, a federal judge, and now as a law dean, I can tell you he can play. In fact, how did he get me here today? He called me and he said, you can sit next to me on the floor at Cameron. <laughs> and I took him at his word. 34 years ago, some of our fellow law clerks already called him affectionately Dean Levy, because even then we recognized that he was just a little smarter, a little wiser, and a little nicer than the rest of us, and that remains true today. Your dean has told me about your remarkable class. Like me, some of you are immigrants or children of immigrants. Some of you are the first in your class to go to law school. Others entered law fearing there would be an old boy network, only to find in your classmates a more diverse and supportive group than you ever imagined. And I look, as I look out over your faces, I think back to what Jackie Robinson once said about baseball. He said, you know, it became a much, much better game when everyone could play. And I see among you, Yuki's friends, 100 international graduate students from 42 countries. To you, I feel a special bond. I live here because my late father came here from Korea as a graduate law student. My first law school graduation was his. And when I see parents waving, I always see him although he passed away 25 years ago. Because every first of the month, he would write our tuition checks. And I remember saying to him once, Dad, I'm sorry that my tuition is so expensive. And he said, never be sorry. Why do you think I work? Why do you think I live? If I give you this education, I give you everything. And so, in your faces, parents, I see the face of my own father. Now, soon after his time in law school, my father served his government as ambassador in Washington, but the government was overthrown by a military coup. And so I grew up in America. And when I was representing the United States at the UN a few years ago, I sat next to an ambassador from another country, and he leaned over and he said to me, I just Googled you. He said, your father was an ambassador to the United States. In one generation, you became an ambassador from the United States. In this entire world, America is the only country where that could happen, and that is why you are the greatest nation.
what he was saying, it is not your weapons, it is not your wealth, it is your openness, it is your diversity, it's your commitment to advancement through law that is the source of America's global leadership. And when I served in government, no day passed that I didn't marvel that the son of a Korean immigrant could be giving legal advice to a woman Secretary of State and an African-American president. All of us lawyers in a country where not so long ago, none of us would have had the right to vote. Today, let me ask you graduates this question first posed by the poet Mary Oliver. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Because you now have your education, but as Yale's chaplain William Sloan Coffin once said, the goal of education is not to drive a wedge between thought and action, it is to enable action of a higher kind. What higher kind of action will you pursue? And let me venture two predictions. First, your careers will inevitably combine the local and the global. For yours is the first genuinely global generation. The defining image of your era is not a world divided by the Berlin Wall. It is one connected by a worldwide web. A friend told me, if 30 years ago you could sit on a park bench and have all the knowledge of the world flow into your lap, they would have called you a god. And now it's you using your laptop to surf Wikipedia. 30 years ago, if you could walk down the street talking and they could hear your voice in China, they would call you God. Today, it's just you calling Shanghai on your cell phone. But here's the catch. Until now, you, the members of the class of 2015, have thought of these technologies as toys, not tools. You've used them to imagine yourself a rock star or a candy crusher. But have you used these tools to lift others out of poverty and disease? How many of you have used the internet to fight imaginary wars? How many of you have used them to end real wars? If you take up this challenge, you will need my own life's tool, international law. The framers of the Declaration of Independence called on our new nation to give decent respect to the opinions of mankind. But too many of today's Americans believe that international law is not law, and we Americans need not respect it. But what I have learned is that respecting international law is not just a founding national principle. In most cases, it's the right and smart thing to do. It cannot be a straitjacket, but if we don't obey it, we squander our moral authority, diminish our capacity to lead, and weaken international law's ability to protect our own citizens. At my law school graduation, I heard law described as the wise restraints that make us free. And to those who fear that international law constrains us, I say it frees us to communicate, to travel, to study, to work abroad, to engage in global markets, things we can only do because of international law. Some fear that if we engage the international system, we will surrender our sovereignty. But sovereignty today means not retreating, but proactively addressing problems that demand global solutions, like climate change, global health, food security, internet governance, counterterrorism. If we don't attack those problems together with international law as our tool, we will have no global solutions. A second prediction, in your careers, you will try to serve both the private and the public interest. I'm going home after this to see my mother. At my law school graduation, I told her proudly of the income I would earn at my new law firm. She said, do they need you the most? I said, what? Do they need you the most? She said, you have the best education that money can buy. You have the most privilege. Isn't it time that you serve those with the least privilege? And as you go through life, answer that question by promoting the public good as you see it. 
There are so many ways that you can do it. By working for the government as a lawyer, by taking pro bono cases, by leading civil society organizations, by organizing action groups within your churches and communities. You, the class of 2015, have honed your skills. Some of you have specialized in law and entrepreneurship and in business to help advise as to how to create more sustainable, equal, and just communities. And as we heard from Chris, your class has learned about the justice gap through addressing situations like Ferguson, Staten Island, and Baltimore by working through your own clinics on wrongful convictions, appellate litigation, international human rights, and civil justice. Make no mistake, we live in fearful and cynical times. But 40 years ago, the U.S. Attorney General told the graduating law class, and I repeat his words to you today, you stand where fear and cynicism now meet. But there is also a great trust waiting to be reawakened. And by your conduct and your skill, and by virtue of what you have learned here, you will show the people of America that they may trust again in the law and in you. That Attorney General's son is now your dean. And across the decades, they too ask you together, as President Kennedy once did, to ask what you can do for your country, because frankly, it has never needed you more. As you engage these challenges, globalization and public interest, let me make three simple requests. First, fly into the flame. Try new things. Take that risk. Ships are safe in harbor, but harbors are not what ships are for. Others will always urge you to play it safe. You have to urge yourself to take chances. And new beginnings are scary, and everyone is afraid. You're afraid. Right now, you're afraid. You should be afraid. Be very afraid. But that's not a reason to stop. The only shame is in not daring. And you will find the greatest satisfactions come when you succeed in the face of your fears. A second request, remember my mother's favorite Korean saying, never let your skill exceed your virtue. Never let your skill exceed your virtue. As lawyers, you will develop skills that will give you power that few possess. The tools to throw people in jail, to save millions of dollars, the power to destroy people's lives. Use those tools wisely, and remember that each has its time and place. iPhones are great for communicating with Moscow, but they really have no place at the dinner table. Use the awesome power of cross-examination to break down a hostile witness, sure, uh, but try to turn it off when you're talking to your kids. A third request, live your values. They make you who you are. In the years ahead, you will have many clients, but your most important clients will not be the ones who pay you. Your constant client will be the integrity of the law itself. A good lawyer is not just a counselor who tells her clients what the law says. She's also a conscience who warns her clients not to follow options that are lawful, but awful. So as a lawyer, remember two phrases. The first, I don't know. I don't know. Practice saying it. You'll use that a lot the first few years. Often you won't be sure. Don't fake it. Be honest. Don't be embarrassed. Most people don't know. But you'll find out and give the right answer soon enough. And the second crucial word, no. No. All lawyers want to tell their clients yes. When your client is the Secretary of State, or the President of the United States, or the future President of the United States, it's hard to tell them no. But as one of my predecessors as legal advisors of the State Department says, never tell your client no when the law and conscience say yes, but never ever say yes when the law tells you no. 
So let me close with my own bad news and good news. The bad news is that in the years ahead, you will face many difficult choices. You will feel very lonely. For all the love that is arrayed around you today, you will find some decisions that only you will make, and you will have to make them alone. But here's the good news. As you face these hard choices about life and law, more and more you will come to trust yourselves. You will come to believe in yourselves. Because, surprise, after years of seeking wisdom from others, you will find it in yourselves. And so today, before you leave, look here at your teachers. Think of the ideas they've shared with you. Look at your loved ones, those who are here, and those who couldn't be here. Draw strength from their enormous faith and love in you. Think of your classmates. Remember all you have shared with one another. But take the last moment to look inside yourselves and trust the wisdom that you find there. As Adlai Stevenson once said, as you leave here, remember why you came. Remember your dreams, remember your values, the values that brought you here and that have brought you through here. Happy graduation, congratulations, and Godspeed.